We're moving in now on to the third of the pioneers that, that we're covering in our 27 pioneer overview. And this is a man by the name of George Storrs. How many of you have not heard of George Storrs before? Okay. It's a fairly uncommon name in Adventist history, even though you'll find as we finish going through this short outline on his life, that his contribution uh, was very significant in terms of his own personal walk in Bible study and what it led to in terms of our understanding in one of the Bible concepts that is clearly identified as one of the landmarks. I'm thinking of the 1889 statement by Ellen White after Minneapolis when she was reminiscing on Butler's telegram, Stand by the Landmarks. She listed what the landmarks were in basically in order to show that his worry about changing the landmarks was actually um, imaginary, I think is the way she put it. The, the point being that um, what he thought was removing the landmarks was not, and as she listed the landmarks, what we're going to look at in the life of George Storrs was one of the landmarks. Again, I would refer you to the source of most of this material, if not all of it, it actually was a biographical sketch he gave of himself in the collection on the CD-ROM entitled Six Sermons on the Inquiry, Is There Immortality in Sin and Suffering? 1855. So that's on the CD-ROM, and this is the sources of it. You'll see the references on the paragraphs are referring to that. By the way, when we post these uh, reviews on the internet, there will be, these handouts will be available for downloading as well. So it will be in a PDF format. This will be on your... Yes, on the, no, on APL's website. That's why I put the web address up at the top, um, aplib.org. George Storrs was born in 1796, as you can see, December 13, in Lebanon, New Hampshire. A lot of these early people were New Englanders. Um, and that factors into a lot of what we understand about them. As we can see from his own reference there, he was the youngest of eight children. His father was a Colonel Constant Stores, originally from Connecticut, and his father was a mechanic. Okay? And he served for a while in the American Revolution as a wheelwright. What do wheelwrights do? Back in those, right? Back in those days, um, they had to have someone to. They didn't have wheels like we have now, and tires, you know, and tire stores. They were usually wooden wheels with a metal band, <laughs> and so they had to keep those um, in shape. And so that's he was obviously a mechanic dealing with wheels. Now, 1796 is how long after the Declaration of Independence? 20 years, okay. So he's the youngest of eight children. You can see uh, fairly obviously that it goes back to the time of the Revolution. The Revolution being fought after the Declaration of Independence, obviously. Uh, Cornwallis's surrender at, George, at Yorktown was what year? Reviewing American history? <laughs> 1781. 1781, five years after the Declaration. Just across the river from where my mother grew up. <laughs> so it's... It, a little bit connected to our family history as well. Um, after the war, after the Rev War of Revolution, um, his father married a Lucinda Howe. And in the statement about George that he, he's obviously talking about himself in the third person, but he's, he's the one that's writing this. George's mind was deeply exercised on the things of religion from a child. Many anxious desires filled his heart that he might be a Christian. Early had his mother taught him to acknowledge our Father who art in heaven and point him to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Experimental religion, however, was a mystery to his mind, the one that he often anxiously desired to solve. So we're seeing here a child who is sensitive to spiritual things and trying to not just, you know, receive the concepts his mother is telling him, but experience them. You know. 
That's experimental religion is talking about. And his statement, happy for him that he had such a mother. But for her instruction, he has often thought and felt that he would never have been brought to a saving knowledge of God and his Christ. The sweet and heavenly strains of prayer poured forth by that mother when she took George to her closet and sought the mercy of God in Christ for him made him forget or disregard the false teaching of the mere theologian. Very interesting way he's putting this. <laughs> Such scenes told on his heart not to be obliterated. That's the way they said it back then. He never forgot it. <clears throat> Any thoughts on that? Very significant testimony as to his early influences. They, don't, they, they cannot be underestimated influence of the mother upon her children in this way. Um, the unsung heroes of history <laughs> are very likely the mothers, right? We come to his teenage years, 1833, age 17. We see that he... 1813? Right. That's what I meant to say, whatever I said. 1813... <laughs> hmm? Yes, because that's the first date we have in the table. That's when he was born. Yeah. December 13, 1896. So now we're 17, some 17 years later, in the year 1813, we're told that he deliberately began to seek to know the goodness of God. And this is how he described it. The preachings of the torments of hell never won his heart, though it often filled him with a dread of God, which was calculated more to drive him from God than to draw him to such a being. From 15 to 17 of, uh, years of age was the most thoughtless period of his life. Not unlike teenagers of today, right? Mm -hmm. They're trying to find themselves during those years and things are really in transition and, and uh, the mind becomes distracted, perhaps we could say. None of the terrors of preaching and again, he seems to be referring back to the preaching of hell, right? None of the terrors of preaching had any tendency to win him to the service of God. But at the close of the time last mentioned, in meditation alone, far removed from all excitement, he became so affected with a sense of the goodness of God to him that he resolved henceforth to seek the Lord till he should find him. If he could pray for nothing else, he determined to pray daily that God would show him his need of a Savior, which theoretically he understood, but experimentally he had not realized. His resolution being made, he pursued noiselessly and alone his purpose, light gradually breaking upon his mind till he was led to bow to Jesus and come to God by him and found mercy. After months had passed away in this manner, he expressed to his mother one day that he much liked to hear a man talk who always talked sweetly about Jesus. Obviously not these thundering hellfire sermons, right? His mother said to him, George, do you think you're a Christian? From that time, Himself and mother had frequent conversations, and she often prayed with and for him, being a mother indeed in more senses than one. He has never ceased to bless God for that mother. Quite a testimony, huh? Mm -hmm. So we can see, again, how a young man's heart is reached. This, this young man's heart is reached, and... Uh, responding and, and searching on his own. Um, age 19, he's converted and he joins the Congregational Church. He's married um, some three years later, around 1818. <coughs> it's interesting to think of these dates too in light of the other men that we've already looked at. Um, if you want to, you can you know, lay these things side by side and begin to put, see how these, these lives somewhat weave together. 
they're growing up in the same periods of time. Joseph Bates, William Miller, uh, even though obviously we're getting younger and younger as we're going through these people. The next decade, 1820s, 1825, age of 29, his wife dies. And uh, some very touching things are written about that if you want to read, read the details of that. At that point, he's, he's uh, I believe it was during the, the sickness of his wife, he was drawn to the Methodist. And he joined the Methodist Traveling Connection, which I believe was the title for an itinerant ministry among the Methodists in 1825. And shortly afterward that, he married again. Uh, ten years later, the next highlight in his life that I wanted to look at, he's now some 39 years of age, he's arrested for praying for slaves at Sanborton Bridge. And that's now, if you look at the history online, tells you that that town is now called Tilton, New Hampshire. At the Methodist Church there, he was praying for slaves, 1835. 30 years before the, almost 30 years before the Civil War, right? He's praying for slaves, and he gets arrested, okay? Um, as I recall, the case was uh, settled in his favor. The next year, at age 40, he becomes a local preacher, which means um, he's appointed apparently to a local a location, but the record is that he traveled even more. And he spent most of his time lecturing and preaching on the subject of slavery. So he was an abolitionist. One of those that early on saw the immorality of what was happening in the nation, particularly the southern colonies there. Southern states, I should say. We're told that nearly the whole Methodist Episcopal Church was hostile to an agitation of that subject. And as we look at the next story, the next life uh, that we're going to go through, we'll find even more information because this same church, the Methodist Episcopal Church, factors in. And it's clear that the leadership of that church did not want the slavery question agitated. They actually wanted to keep the, the church together nationwide in the North and the South. There were a lot of churches that split over this issue because... Um, Obviously, the people in the South stood in favor of it, and the people in the North said, we're not going to be part of you anymore. And they actually formed other, other, other denominations in contrast to that. The next year, 1837, he's 41 years old. And by the way, on these ages, um, we're just looking at the year of birth to this year. Um, we're not specifying where he is in relation to his birth, birth date that year, right? So he could be in his 30, 41st year or after his 41st birthday sometime that year, 1837. He reads a small tract by a man named Henry Grew. He was a deacon. And this tract was on the state of the dead. And here's how he describes it. This is, this is where um, George Storrs begins a new direction in his life that has a major impact for the Seventh-day Adventist church later on. You can see, as of now, he's not even um, connected with any Advent movement, right? We're just looking at this man's life up to a point where it's going to be, there's going to be some connections here. Here's how he described this um, event in 1837. In 1837, three years prior to his withdrawal from the M.E. Church, that was the Methodist Episcopal Church, his mind was first called to a consideration of the subject of the final destiny of wicked men as being, possibly, an entire extinction of being and not endless preservation in sin and suffering. This was by a small anonymous pamphlet put forth as he learned, in other words, he's, he later learns who the author is, <laughs> put forth as he learned by Henry Grew of Philadelphia. He read it to pass away a leisure hour while passing from Boston to New York. The story is that he was on a train. It was not an express train. Can you imagine what a, a, uh, a train that's not an express train back in those years was doing? It was called a slow train. <laughs> it stopped in every village, probably. It's like our buses, you know. And so it's, he's, not, he's not getting there fast. So he has, has something to read spend his time. This is what he's reading. It was strange to him 
that so plausible and scriptural an argument could be made in defense of a doctrine which he had always regarded as unworthy of a serious consideration. For he had never doubted that man possessed an immortal soul. A new train of thought had now been waked up in his mind. But he proceeded with great caution in examining the subject and in conversing with anyone upon it. These were cautious people okay? and not easily swayed by every wind, as you might want to say, as it says in Ephesians. He searched the scriptures carefully and sought every opportunity to get information from ministers in particular. As the inquiry continued, the strongest arguments urged against this, to him, new view, served to carry his mind into the conviction of its truthfulness and scriptural basis. After several years' investigation, conversation, and correspondence with some of the most eminent ministers and looking to God for direction, he became settled that man has no immortality by his creation or birth, and that all the wicked will God destroy, utterly exterminate. This was a revolutionary change of thought for him, obviously. Um, we might look back and say, yeah, it's obvious, but it, not in his day, and it was a very minority view of how mankind's nature exists. Created with an immortal soul or not created with immortality? Yes, Martha. The question is about Martin Luther, whether he understood the non-immortality of the soul. I believe there was some understanding on his part, as I recall. Now, there were elements, elements, elements of it in the Reformation, um, but it was definitely a minority view, and you, it still remains one, even though there's a, a resurgence in interest in the last uh, several decades. Interestingly enough, he leaves the Methodist Church in 1840, the age of 44, and um, very likely seems to be related to his movement and understanding more of Scripture. The spring of 41... At the age of 45, he publishes 2,000 copies of an inquiry. Are the souls of the wicked immortal? In three letters. Now, the background for that is what he wrote here. He wrote three letters to a prominent and able minister of the Methodist E Church with whom he had been intimate. So, as he said, he corresponded, he studied, and this was one of the gentlemen that he worked with. Uh, worked it through with. In reply, this minister acknowledged that he could not answer Mr. Storr's arguments, and he never undertook it. On the contrary, after a few months, they had an interview and examined the subject together, which resulted in his advising Mr. Storrs to publish the letters he had written him, but with a request to withhold his name. It is not clear to me who the, his name is, it probably was the Methodist minister's name, because I think Storrs did publish this with his own name attached to it. So that was the background for him publishing, 2,000 copies there in the spring of 41. So you can see how the Lord is prompting interest in key biblical understandings in the years leading up to the Advent movement, not just Miller studying the prophecies and looking at the second coming, but also people looking at the considerations of, of this. We'll make some observations later on why this is very important. Um, it, the observations are not specifically on this review of this man's life because it seems to be outside of that. If for some reason I forget to do that at the end, you remind me before we wrap, wrap up his consideration. The next year, 1842, he moves to Albany, age of 46, preaches six sermons on the state of the dead, and then he publishes them. That same year, he hears the Millerite message for the first time. He arranges for Charles Fitch to hold tent meetings. And he's convinced of the message and begins to preach it to thousands. So now he becomes an Adventist preacher. He believes in the coming of Christ, according to the prophecies. 
and he's beginning to preach that message powerfully. Okay? And here's how he describes that. Early in the spring of 1842, he determined to give one sermon, italics in the original, that should embody all that might be desirable to present in relation to it, and that's the subject of death, you know, that he's been focused on prior to this Advent message coming to him. The appointment was made one week beforehand and public notice given in the city papers. So this is like a minister saying, next Sunday I'm going to preach on this topic. So if anybody wants to come, they can come to his church to listen to him preach. Monday previous to the time appointed, he went to his study and there spent the entire week in investigation, meditation, and prayer. Thus was the first discourse prepared. Never had he a deeper and sweeter sense of the divine presence and blessing and of being engaged in a work well-pleasing in his sight, God's sight. And he could as well doubt any other part of his Christian experience as to doubt that. Can you see that experience that he had? As he's working on this first sermon, <laughs> the Lord came close to him. The Holy Spirit was there. And um, he was convinced, as much as he was convinced about anything in his Christian walk, that this was what God wanted him to do, that this was the truth. His second week was spent in his study in the same manner as the first had been. And thus was the second discourse prepared, but found there must be a third, and so did the matter proceed till he had prepared and preached the sixth discourse. And the history of the first week in his study is the history of the six weeks, each of which was spent in the same manner as the first. All week long, meditating, studying, praying, and feeling God's presence with him. Six sermons, six weeks. In December of 42, he, he publishes 5,000 copies of his six sermons. And he scatters, in New York City, in New York there, and he scatters them over the United States. And then he revises them and he pr sends 10,000 more out. So this is not being done in a corner. This is not some small, you know, thing that's passed around one city. This is, the Lord's impressing him to flood the nation with these sermons. 1843, when he's 47 years old, the six sermons are published in England, convincing a number of prominent people, including Archbishop Richard Watley. And that year he begins to publish his own periodical called the Bible Examiner. The spring of 43, he preaches the Advent in Philadelphia, and he distributes 2,000 copies of his six sermons, six sermons to the congregation there. The fall of 43, he distributes 5,000 copies in Ohio and Indiana. This man is a printer and you know, distributor. He's getting the word out. He's convinced that this is an important topic. What's the response? Well, here's, here's a very amazing response. January of 44, January 25, when he's 48, Charles Fitch takes his stand with him on the state of the dead. And here's what Fitch wrote. Dear Brother Stores, as you have long been fighting the Lord's battles alone on the subject of the state of the dead and of the final doom of the wicked, I write this to say that I am at last, after much thought and prayer and a full conviction of my duty to God, prepared to take my stand by your side. Amen. So this man, uh, Fitch, you can imagine... Um, if time were to have lasted for him, which we will cover later in one of our overviews as to what happened with him, he didn't, he didn't live to see even the disappointment. But he was also learning and, and growing uh, in the knowledge of Scripture at that time too. A lot of amazing things were happening. Unfortunately, we have to document the next event, and that is in May, of 20, May 23 of 44, William Miller rejects his view on the state of the dead and comes out publicly opposing George Storr's view on that. Never did accept it. Obviously, the next event in the major events of Advent history would be the disappointment, right? October of 44, the month that Fitch dies, the month, uh, and the month that the disappointment takes place. 
November of that year, then the month after the disappointment, he begins to work in Philadelphia, and he works there through 1852, April of 1852. And he describes that um, in, this, in these words. It may be proper in this place to say that he labored statedly in the city of Philadelphia from November of 44 to April of 52, employing nearly all his time among that people, but never seeking for or consenting to an organization such as all sects labor to establish. He had no desire to create his own following. He believed that love was the bond of union, and that when that could not bind a people together, they had better separate. For the last two or three years of his residence in Philadelphia, he was called more to visit different places of the country, and finally concluded to remove to New York as a more central position for visiting abroad. So he still had his burden to minister to people to carry the message about um, the truth of the state of man. In 1849, he says uh, this description of him was given. He was at 53 at the time. It's a rather lengthy description. I've only given you just a portion of it here. Speaking of George Storrs, his object is truth, and this he strives to obtain no matter at what sacrifice. He consults duty before expediency and would sooner stand alone with truth then go with the multitude and be in error. Yet he is not dogmatical in the advocacy of what he conceives to be the truth, but is rather persuasive, conciliatory, and argumentative. Probably not in the negative sense that we think of argumentative now, but you know, he, he has arguments for his case. He is a warm friend, a good companion, and an excellent counselor. Unfortunately, we don't know why um, he did not accept the light of the third angel which after the disappointment helped them to understand what had actually happened October there of 44 in fulfillment of the prophecies of Daniel 8, 14. Uh, he moved in 52 to New York, as he mentioned. 55, the plates for that publication that he had done on six sermons burned. So he revised and enlarged and republished it. And the one that we referenced at the very beginning, if you'll notice, was dated 1855. So what I've, been, what I've been extracting here for you in these extracts about him was the 1855 version of those six sermons, and they are all on the CD-ROM if you want to read through them. Those six sermons are published there <coughs> and available. He lived another some 24 years, and he died in his 80s in 1879. That's George Storrs. Now you know who George Storrs was. And you can imagine that the knowledge that he shared through these publications impacted more than Charles Fitch among the Advent believers because he obviously worked among them extensively. Why would you think this view or this understanding is important? Just tell me why you think it's important to understand what happens to someone when they die, what happens to someone at the end when God punishes the wicked? Um, what reasons can you think of for that being important? Yes? I, I just wondering, you know, this, um, this, this experiment of sin, like God has, in a sense, had to sustain sin. I mean, mm -hmm. Because God is the life giver and we owe our life to Him. And it seemed like if, if the wicked you know, were living for forever, then, then God is, you know, forever. There, there's never this closure to sin. And God is forever sustaining. Mm -hmm. I, all of you can hear her well, but uh, for the sake of the recording, I'll just repeat that briefly. Um, Martha said that the God is during the great controversy sustaining sin. And I, I could add to that. Otherwise, we'd all be dead, right? Because sin is that deadly. So He's sustaining it. But were he to sustain sinners forever, and we could add in a state of suffering even, there's no closure. Because forever, sinners exist. And in that sense, sin exists. It's not brought to an end. And can you think of other reasons why this is an important concept? Where do we have first, the first inklings of confusion over this issue? In Eden, did you say? What, what, what happened there? What was the confusion there? They bought his lie. 
Okay, they, bu- they being Adam and Eve, bought Satan's lie. Okay, that you shall not surely die. Um, that sometimes is called the first lie. I believe, in a, in, a, in a sense, it's actually a denial of the consequence of the first lie. Because I believe prior to the, prior to the idea that you don't die if you sin, is the idea that if you sin, it's not sin. In other words, Satan said to Adam and Eve, take the fruit, okay? And the implication was that God was keeping something from them, and there was nothing wrong in taking the fruit. Because before death comes what? Sin. Before death comes sin. Death is not the worst thing. Sin's the worst thing. Sin is but death is but the result of sin. So the lie was regarding the sin. The fundamental lie. The fundamental lie was you're not gonna you know, this is not the way to die, this is the way to live. <laughs> you know, live for yourself. Take what God is withholding from you. And so saying you won't die was denying the consequence of that. Um, which is very I think important to realize that that that's there. So it does go back to that point. Um, and it, so it gets to the fundamental issue of the great controversy, sin and death, this whole thing of sin and death. Paul writes extensively about the law of sin and death. Romans, he labels it explicitly the law of sin and death, Romans 8, verse 2, where he says the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me, what? Free of the law of sin and death. And powerful passage there in Romans 7, Romans 8, on showing how God has victory over sin and victory over death. And uh, that's, that's, the, that's salvation. Salvation is, is freedom from both of those things. You can't have one without the other. So the idea then of, of someone never dying, even if they sin, basically says sin does not lead to death, right? Unless you have to redefine death as some type of a process of where you're, you know, you're 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 living, <laughs> but still dying in some sense, which is sort of bizarre. Um, can you think? Well, what what are some of the practical implications of not understanding that 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 when you die, you don't die? Now, actually, let me let me back up just a bit. When a person dies. And how many of you have seen a person die? Okay. Okay, some of us have seen a person die. What happens, um, what happens to your understanding of what took place at that point based on this Bible teaching that helps you, um, that helps you, let me just put it that way. They, they do what, you say? They've gone to sleep, okay? They've gone to sleep. In other words, uh, they, be, they will be awakened at some point, which, which puts your focus on the resurrection, obviously, the biblical teaching of the resurrection. And we're told that all will be resurrected, right? Whether or not they're going to spend eternity with God or not, they'll be resurrected. So, but they've gone to sleep. You look at, you look at that death as a sleep. Okay? And what, is, what does that save you from? What problems would that might, might, might that save you from? Saves you from believing in eternal torment. Okay. Well, eternal torment's going to come after the, the resurrection, the resurrection that follows the sleep. But what my point is right now, my focus is right now, knowing that that person is asleep. Yeah, what, when they die, they're not going to heaven immediately. Okay. You're not confused as to thinking that they're in heaven. What what also might you be protected against? Spiritualism. Spiritualism, which there are instances where people encounter those who have died, supposedly, which is basically the whole area of spiritualism. How common is that these days? It's a, it's it's extensively common. It's, it's more much much more common than it ever used to be. Uh, the media is full of it. It seems to be. Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm amazed that we don't have politicians holding seances in order to find out what to do. Maybe they are, they, just, they don't publicize it. Um, but basically it opens you up to that whole realm of looking to the dead for guidance. Is that right? Because people often, you know, let me talk to my dead mother because I need to get her advice on something, you know. Or, you know, it goes back to the Witch of Endor with Saul and, and Samuel, that story there in the Bible. So it saves you from that, the danger of being deceived by the spirits uh, who masquerade as dead people. Um, can you think of any other reasons why this doctrine is important? I submit that the most important reason we haven't touched on. Yes, Martha? Well, you know that you know, your, the deceased loved ones aren't looking down and seeing, seeing that this, this end of the world that continues to go on in the okay. family. Okay. Like and that makes you feel that they're not having to endure the sight of pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's useful for individual individually thinking about your relatives that are passed away. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't answer, I think, any significant great controversy question because we know God and the angels are watching everything and enduring that. And we do know there's human beings in heaven that are looking down, watching, and enduring. So uh, we're just happy our relatives aren't, aren't having to endure that. But there are, there are those that are doing that. And they've been resurrected, though, or translated without seeing death, right? There's clear evidence that there's human beings in heaven that are there because of the resurrection and translation, those two biblical teachings. Can you think of any more uh, reasons why it's important? Maybe profoundly <coughs> insignificant reasons. Yes? If people go straight to heaven, then where is the need for Christ's second coming? Okay. If if people go to heaven when Christ, when they die, then why does Christ need to come back? In other words, what is the need of the resurrection? And uh, that most Christians who believe in immortality would say that God does want to put the soul and the body back together, and so He comes back to get the the body and put together with the soul. Yes. The character of God. Okay. Yeah, um, it's amazing to have a realization that perhaps your parents are more compassionate than God is if God's tormenting people forever and human beings don't do that. Um, yeah, it does have major implications. And we, we read this here in George Storr's experience, did we not? He said the preachings of the torment of hell never won his heart. And it served to drive him more from God than to draw him to such a being. Uh, how many people that has that been the experience of? Yeah. Um, I believe there's documented cases of insanity that resulted from people who believe this doctrine and felt like they could not be Christians unless they held on to it. Um, but I think there's more atheists because of it than there are insane people. That's what she says in Great Controversy that some of the people in the insane asylums are there because of yeah. the doctrine of uh, eternal, it, eternal, eternal torment. Eternal, eternal torment. torment. Yeah, that's right. That's a major, major issue. Again, it comes back to what we were saying earlier. God's perpetuating sin and suffering rather than ending it and, and finally bringing a closure on it. And that's a, ma a major thing as well. But there's actually, uh, in fact, um, I'm thinking of a text that we should look at um, which speaks to that. Um,
there's two texts actually from Ezekiel. Ezekiel 18.32 and Ezekiel 33.11. Uh, this, these in and of themselves do not really say that the dead are not going to live forever or the wicked are not going to live forever in torment. But it does, it does picture God's attitude toward the whole thing. Um, Ezekiel 18.32, I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord. Wherefore, turn, you, you, turn yourselves and live ye. And then 33.11, as I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? You have to really define, redefine death to understand this eternal torment thing because um, I don't know why. I mean, it's, it's like God's, if, if you believe it, and you believe this text, you're saying God's letting something go on for eternity that he has no pleasure in. And like, you know, what is, how, how is that going to be uh, an eternity of, of peace and, and bliss? doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But there's still an even more fundamental thing, which I believe, not that I'm saying that, that the question about God's character is not fundamental, but in the plan of salvation, in the process of the plan of salvation, it's vitally important to understand this because of the implications for the, for the central event in the plan of salvation. What was the central event? The cross of Christ. Okay? And again, what happened on the cross? What happened to Christ? What? He died. I think it was what I heard someone say, <laughs> barely. And then you said he died the second death. So the Bible differentiates between two types of death. Okay? In the first death we've already talked about, that those of us ha that have seen people die have observed. And we call that type of death sleep. Jesus called it that over and over again. You know, the maid is sleeping. I go to wake, it, wake her up regarding this little girl that had died. And my friend Lazarus sleeps, you know, all these stories. But the other death, that's called a second death, how is it not asleep? Not being resurrected again. Okay. Ceased to exist. Okay. Not resurrected again, ceased to exist. Um, in which sense did Christ die that? Okay, the idea is that when he died, the humanity that he took in the incarnation was crucified and, and never was resurrected. He was resurrected with a, with a glorified body, with a, with a new humanity. Uh, not new in the sense that he looked differently, but obviously the, rec the disciples recognized him. But he had, and he, he did retain some evidences from the previous experiences, right? He had the scars. He pointed those out to his disciples. But it clearly it's, it was a glorified body. So in the, in the experience of the cross itself, if the teaching contrary to what George Storrs came to understand here is true, that we have an immortal soul, that when we die, it's just a portal, as I was hearing someone describe recently on a podcast. Death is just a portal through which you walk, a door that you walk through into another existence. Okay. Um, what does that say about the death Christ died? It was not clearly the second death then, right? I mean, what, in what sense was it that he died the second death? We said, we said it was a sense in which he did not resurrect the sinful fallen flesh that he had taken. 
but there's another sense in which he died the second death too. When he went into that experience, how did how, how what type of an experience was it for him? Did he feel the separation from his father? Okay, he he felt clearly separation from his father because he said, "My God, my God, why have you forsaken me?" There's statements of Jesus on the cross. It's very, very important as you meditate on the final events of Christ's life to consider all the statements that he made on the cross. There's not that many. <coughs> but there are two distinct categories of statements. And if you think about it, it dawns on you. One category of statements are negative, one, are po one is positive. Have you ever had a, an experience where you have mixed emotions? Okay. Um, someone I heard commenting on the scripture and saying how um, how difficult it was for them to really accept the, the Bible as it's written because all of these contradictions um, and the stories of the gospel writers don't agree with each other and you know it's it's again the idea that they, they can't put things together in a meaningful whole um, we're told that as he entered that experience let me ask it as a question first of all uh, do you think as he entered that experience it says in John 13, remember when he um, was with his disciples right there at the end? The very first verse of John 13, this is right before the Lord's Supper. It says, Jesus knew that he, his hour had come. Up to that point, what had he always been saying? My hour, My hour has not yet come. And he said it he said it in answer to many different types of situations. From the wedding feast of Cana, I think it was the first record of it, you know, through his brother saying, you know, why don't you make yourself known, um, and so forth and so on. But now it says he knew that his hour had come. Uh, I believe that's on the timetable of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9. That he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he did what? He loved them to the end. Okay. So the question that I wanted to ask in, in the context of the cross was that at any point in that experience, did he stop loving? No. Oh, so that his love never went away all the way through that to where he breathed his last breath. Love never disappeared. Okay. Let me ask another question. Do you think he ever lost his faith mm -hmm. in that experience? Faith, we're told, is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Okay. What is faith anchored on? What is faith anchored on? I my my evidence points toward what Dorothy said that it is evident is anchored in the past. It's 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 uh, this is the way Romans ten puts it. Faith comes by. Hearing, and hearing by what? The word, of God. word of God. Okay, had Christ heard the word of God? Where do you think he first heard the word of God? From his mother. Okay, and then he, as he studied the scriptures himself, he heard the word of God. But he also had experiences where he heard the word of God audibly, right? And it was very important what he heard in those instances. What what what, what was the statement? It was always somewhat the same. <laughs> This is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. And here's your identity, and here's your acceptance. Okay. Um, faith is anchored on these evidences that, that we've been given from the Word of God. Not just, you know, the Word that goes back to Genesis 1, but the Word that we've encountered in our own personal life, our walk with God, right? <clears throat> Those are the experiences that we have. And those are the evidences for our faith. Will those evidences ever change? Can you change the past? No. You can give up on them as evidences. You can say, "Well, I don't, I don't value them anymore. I don't, I don't consider them significant. I'm not going to, I'm not going to consider them, you know, things that direct my life." But that means you are giving up your faith in that sense. 
so Christ, as he entered the, the darkness of that experience, Gethsemane and Calvary, um, he had, I find no evidence that he lost his faith. And I find even evidence that when he refused the intoxicating uh, potion that they gave him to numb him, numb his pain, it was because he wanted to keep a clear memory, a clear mind. Um, because you can have, pain can, can cloud your mind, but pain, pain doesn't have to numb you like pain, uh, painkillers do. So I believe that's what, ha what happened to him. And I don't find any evidence that he gave up his faith. Because he, he remembered the past. And he was hanging on to that. In fact, that's why he was speaking to the father. You know, had he given up the past, his father would have been no longer his father. And so why would he be talking to him? So the very fact that he's talking to him, even crying out to him, as he did. Uh, beside that, it says faith is the substance of things hoped for, which means faith can project which direction? Into the future. Because what you hope for, you don't have yet, right? So faith can project into the future. Um, and this is something I don't fully understand because the statement to the thief, I believe, was a statement of faith. You will be with me in paradise. It was a statement of faith. Based on what he knew about paradise, <laughs> based on what he had understood about when that happens and what, you know, what the future holds, again, by the word of God, right? by the word of God. But there's this thing called hope that actually, it seems to me, is a, an experiential thing at the time where you're able to see a future that's better than the present. That's separate from faith. And I don't understand fully how this can be, but the evidence is clear if you look at it that these, are, these can be separated because in his experience, that's what happened. Because we're told as he entered the Calvary and the cross, he lost all hope. Okay, and I believe that that's the essence of entering the second death. For him, it was entering an experience where he had no hope of being resurrected. So I believe it's more accurate to say that that's the type of death he died, a death with no hope of a resurrection. We know that he was predicting his resurrection based, again, on the word of God. He had told them, I'm going to die in three days, I'll be raised. This was before he got into it, right? The only thing like that on the cross, in the cross experience, was, was a statement to the thief. I, you'll be with me in paradise. Which means he's, he must have, has planning to be resurrected. But again, if he had no hope in his death, which is the death of the wicked, and he's dying the death, not because of any of his sins, right? So he's not wicked in that sense. But he's dying because of Sin, right? Whose sin? The sins of the whole world. All of our sins. And so, that the death of sin is the death of the wicked. And Proverbs plainly says that the wicked have no hope in their death. Did you know that? Let me, let me get you the text on that. Um, because that's... Uh, very important uh, realization. Proverbs 14.32 The wicked is driven away in his wickedness, but the righteous hath hope in his death. So if Christ is dying the death, not of the righteous, but of the wicked. Proverbs 14.32 If Christ is dying the death of the wicked, in the sense that he's taking the sins of the world upon himself, and that's the experience he's entering into in relation to his father. What does that sin do for his relationship with his father? It cuts it off. It separates him. And that's, that's to me, the only reason he dies is that that's, that that's what happens. But in that process, as this verse says, um, by implication, by parallelism, he's dying as a wicked man. Again, it's not his sin or he would, he would have been a failure, right? If he, died, died, if he sinned and he died for his own sin, he would have been a failure. And his resurrection proved that to be wrong. But he's dying because of sin. And that means he's dying the death of the wicked. 
And this, there's evidence after evidence that is exactly what, what, what was happening. He was dying the death of the wicked will die at the end. No hope. No hope. And so it's an amazing thing that here's a man who has full of faith and love to the end dies with no hope. That's the mystery of the second death that he entered into. Um, and so everything positive he was saying on the cross were statements of faith and, hope, and, and love. The negative things on the cross were statements of no hope because of the very essence of what the cross was all about. So coming back to our original question, why is this doctrine important? If you have an immortal soul that can't die, then the cross turns into a few hours of suffering. And then he, then he knows that he's immortal and he, he, can't, he can't disappear for good. He'll just be with the Father. Okay? And so the, the extent of his sacrifice is there's like a stake driven into the heart of it. The cross, the depth of the cross, the height and the length and the width and the breadth of God's love shown to us on the cross is, is damage beyond repair, I say. You, st you still can believe that there's some love shown there. <laughs> but if you don't believe in the mortality of the soul, that Christ was facing no future. And that can only be true if he, if he was mortal, right? He had no immortal part of him. So I believe that that's, that's why God was preparing the Advent movement to understand and proclaim the cross with this understanding. I don't think it became clear in those early years even, probably not until the righteousness by faith message came in Minneapolis, where they began to look at really what the cross was all about and understand it better. There's a lot of reasons that God wants us to understand this, this uh, teaching. But that's clearly one of them. So we looked at George Storrs. Here's a picture of him. Um, distinguished looking man. The Lord used him. He did not go with the movement into the understanding of the sanctuary and the Sabbath. Um, but he was uh, used by God powerfully to shine a bright light on this teaching about the, as Ellen White called it in 1889, the non-immortality of the wicked. Man does not have natural immortality. Any other thoughts as we wrap up our talk about him? So, so he did not believe in the third angel's message? Correct. There's no evidence that he accepted the third angel's message after 44. He, it almost sounded like he became independent. That thing that we read toward the end, he said um, he was preaching, he never seeking for or consenting to an organization such as all sex labor to establish. He believed that love is the bond of union and that when, there sh that, when that would not bind a people together, then they had better separate. So it sounded like he became somewhat independent in his preaching and uh, connection with churches. Which uh, is better than some positions. <laughs> Although there is clearly a, the need for people to band, band together. Okay.